Good morning, everybody. My name is Riley Kammer. Uh, I'm a fifth generation rancher out north of Rapid City. I apologize, we're, we're running behind and I don't want to hold lunch up, but uh, this is kind of where our area is. We're north of Rapid City, toward, out towards the foothills of the Black Hills. And um, glad to be here, glad uh, or honored you guys asked me to come down and talk about some of the stuff we're doing on our place. So that's the crew. I got a herd of girls, they're home taking care of the place while I'm gone. We're, I'm pretty proud of them. They're, they're my profit. Our vision is healthy land, wholesome cattle, happy family, and pretty long mission, but we use the resources God's entrusted us with to uh, stimulate robust soil biology, diverse plant communities with regenerative land management practices in order to produce profitable, nutrient-dense, life-giving food from the earth. And we've, we've done a lot of changes on our place. We've moved pretty much completely away from the, uh, the industrial ag model and moved everything we got to a regenerative model back to the land and hasn't always been that way. I used to do everything that, that all the experts told me to do, right? And I was flat ass broke and going backwards and I was taken from the land and in order to subsidize my business that was unprofitable, I had to go look for work. The only thing I could find was I worked for the co-op for three years to uh, help put food on the table and insurance for my kids. And it was about that time I was learning about soil health. And I got a crash course in it because I got to spend time in a three state region, uh, spraying, fertilizing, and hauling feed. And I tell you what, I saw the worst of the worst. Like that. Looks like the, the dirty 30s there, but that's 2017 Butte County, South Dakota. Um, I saw the worst of the worst. I saw land degradation on a first-hand basis with my feet in the dirt. And I saw farmers and ranchers all over the area that were flat broke and had no, no answers, didn't know what to do. How are we going to keep going for another generation? Uh, I hauled a load of feed to some guy that was completely droughted out trying to feed his way out of a drought in, in uh, Broadus, Montana and somebody up there thought it was a good idea to start farming in March, probably to plant oats or whatever and I got to watch all of his topsoil blow away. I was all by myself and I had made the decision right then and there that if, if I was going to be a part of agriculture still that I'm going to do this different. I wasn't going to be a part of the topsoil erosion, the organic matter depletion, the loss of our biodiversity, the loss of our pollinators, the loss of our wildlife, and our bird population. And I'm going to do this different, and I'm going to be a voice for agriculture. So here I am. Um, you see a lot of these, it really changes your paradigm. Here's another one that was just a couple years ago down the road from me. So we, we got a lot of work to do. Here's one, this is our ground. Uh, up the draw from me, we have continuous long-term grazing with no cover. On one side of the draw, on the other side, we got these guys that are no-tilling, but they have no, they have no crop rotation, so they have no armor on their soil. And every time we get a rain, it runs and it's cutting a gully down through us. So the, the, uh, the decisions we make on our place affect our neighbors and the taxpayers and the consumers. In a nutshell, this is what we do. We, we, we manage our grazing for our cattle. Uh, we, we move quite often, usually a week or less. Uh, our entire herd, not the entire place. We, were, we got a lot of lease ground, but uh, this picture here was in the middle of a drought. Before we started changing our management, this was bare soil in this draw and now we're growing, we're growing more grass than, than we ever would have imagined. Um, cutting inputs, cutting costs, and a better quality of life. Um, one of the biggest things I did was I changed my calving date to, to calve in sync with nature. We start now May 1st on our cows. Uh, 
<clears throat> we got a lot of brome and crested. You know, I hear a lot of East River saying that we well, can't graze dormant brome and crested, and we love it. Uh, we got green up through there. It's a perfect ration for a cow, a brood cow. Uh, that center picture, I promise you there's a calf in there. Can't see him. We couldn't find him and neither could his mother. But uh, that's, that's nature's windbreak. God gave us the, the perfect template for, uh, for our livestock production, but we choose to do it in a, in a yard. When we had to change, we were feeding ourselves out of house and home. It was costing us a ridiculous amount of money. Um, ranching for profit school changed my life. Uh, I want a quote from Dave Pratt was, how do you replace spending money with management? That's a tough one because us as ag producers, everybody's in our pocket trying to get our money. And I keep that money in my pocket now. I'm not giving it away. So I figured out strategies how to fix this. And maybe a, a list of things that I do do, but maybe the bigger list is the things that I stop doing. And right there, most of those are all inputs. Uh, it's changed the culture on our ranch. It's changed our lives. It's changed my family and my kids for generations to come on the things that I stopped doing. My family enjoys ranching now. It's not a drudgery. If you could cut any of those things out, how much better would your quality of life be? We graze 12 months out of the year. Snow doesn't slow us down too much. Uh, that was our first year of, of changing our, our grazing management through the winter and we didn't have an easy winter, but we, we made it through, cut our hay, hay feeding down by 75% the first year, uh, just by management, by, by moving some poly wire, moving our cows quite often. So <clears throat> we, we were able to expand and come home, expand our operation. We bought our folks out and we're taking over the home place. It was homesteaded 140 years ago. Uh, but you know, I get home and I, and I see our hay fields are as depleted as any of the other ones I saw through the state. so, states. Um, I had dabbled in cover crop grazing quite a few years before and I, I came up with an idea, well, can we, can we rebuild these soils uh, using cover crops and cattle? And I applied for and got a CIG, Conservation Innovation Grant, from the USDA. And uh, here now we're in the third year of this. So. Uh, Managed grazing is what we do. Uh, the cover crops filling in a gap in the winter. So the, the goal of this project was number one, can we build soil, rebuild soil uh, in semi-arid western South Dakota and two, can we replace all of our winter hay feeding with this project and, and we have. We've been very successful with it. That's, this is the first year. Uh, that's 140,000 pounds of live weight per acre uh, in a in a daily move there. Uh, this is kind of what we're growing. Uh, our range tech, range con, and my daughter there. First year we did it with, with pears and those calves gained just under three pounds a day. Never started a tractor once. We fence line weaned. Uh, this was our first, our second tour. Uh, we had 80, or excuse me, 70 people come to this tour. People are starving for this knowledge. They want a different way of doing things. They're, they're sick of giving all their money away too. So what about snow? Last December when, when it all rolled in, we all remember that and we grazed right on through it. I, I fed them hay and it laid, laid there for three weeks. Cows would rather, our cows anyway, would rather go graze than stand around and eat hay. It's uh, what they were designed to do. That picture was uh, 25 below that morning with a 35 mile an hour wind and, and they're doing just fine. Uh, here's, here's my seed mix for this year. Uh, we used an 11 species diverse mix, mostly 50% grass, 50% broadleaf. Uh, we've settled on these, these species seem to do pretty good in our area and uh, we'll keep going with this. 
So uh, about 22 bucks an acre. That's the mix there. Uh, this was June 27th. That's June 28th. We got completely hailed out this year. Uh, that was in August. It's rebounded. So our, can we build soil? Yes, and, we're, and we'll have the numbers for this the, by this spring, hopefully. But uh, our soil biology is, is, is going up rapidly. They did use up some of the organic matter from the brome grass I terminated. But uh, we know this is happening because our yield is tripling every year. We might have hit peak production here. Um, last year we grew, we tripled our production on two inches less rainfall in the middle of a drought. So there's a lot going on here. That's kind of some of the production there. There's one plot that we, we clipped 22,000 pounds to the acre in western South Dakota with, uh, with just some seed and, and a little help from nature. Uh, here's this year's tour we did and we had, we had 80 people come this year. Uh, like I say, people are starving for knowledge. I uh, had Dr. Chris Nichols come down and Dr. Ray Ward had some spirited conversation, but it was really good. Uh, and so I'm going to let Tance talk here for a little bit. Oh. I was just wondering if you can uh, tell us what you did for water. For stock water? Sure. I have, I got a pipeline that runs next to one of the fields and we tapped into that and put a tank in and the other field I, I dug a well and we got a tank there. So, yep. Uh, they have open water all winter long and can and can go through it. You rotate fields, graze them. We graze, graze through them. Rotate, let them rebound back. No, this is winter grazing strictly. Just straight on, no matter what. This is winter grazing. Okay. This is not, right. not summer or fall. Nope. So we're we're full season. We don't get enough rainfall to, to do what you're saying. Yeah. Most years, maybe one out of five, right? But uh, this, this project was a full season cover crop to, to graze through the winter time. So, With your soil re recap, uh, do you do any soil testing to see? We do, yes. We'll, we'll, and we'll have all that data. I just don't have it today. So we'll have it put together. We think we had an anomaly that uh, we're not sure. The test kind of went wonky. So I am going to continue this project for another couple what years. Do you so we get. Giant war shells. I, I don't know what to do. When it, it comes in such a torrent like that, anything that we try to, any structures we put in there is gonna wipe it out. Because the land above us is not holding, it's not, the, the moisture's not, the brine's not going in, it's running off. It's beating up and running off. Comes down there in a torrent. I'm willing, uh, suggestions I'd, I'd love to know. Other than the neighbors changing their management practices, that would be number one, so. Oh yeah, it would take this out. As much water comes down, it would just wipe them out. Yeah. That particular spot has has a pretty large drainage area, and like Riley's saying, by the time it reaches its next line, the water velocity and volume is such that, like you said, any any structure that isn't totally concrete and anchored like a bridge pillar is going to blow out. So, um, so. The fact of the matter is it's a dysfunctional water cycle, right? Caused by management practices. We fixed, we fixed the water cycle on our, on our grazing land and we don't run any water. We took a three inch rain in 10 minutes and didn't run any water. It's all infiltrating. So continuous grazing, no-till without any cover does the same thing. It, it just runs off, so. It goes into a uh, Antelope Creek, onto Elk Creek, onto the Cheyenne River. So. So chances are many of you in this room, when you show up at a conference like this, have seen the rainfall simulator. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, runoff jars closest to you, the ones that are a little bit more obscured by the front set of jars, are those that are capturing infiltration. Note. The amount of water in the front two jars, only two jars have water in them, continuous grazing and conventional tillage. Also note the clarity of that water versus the jars that are behind them. Those 
jars in the back, there's maybe a, a quarter or a third of the jar uh, has water in the infiltration under rotationally grazed. Zero water or maybe just a few drops under the continuous grazing. A full, almost overflowing jar of infiltration under cover crop. Now that's, um, you know, under a cover crop, not only that, but diverse crop rotation, soil armor, all five principles of soil health which are referenced in this document if you're not committed to memory. And, um, and then no-till, that which the words that you can't read on that sign up there on the second one from the right is, uh, is that it? Diverse crop rotation again, soil armor, all of the things, livestock integration, and then of course conventional tillage. I think I do see a little bit of water in there, but I've run that rainfall simulator enough to know that the water that fell into that jar in a two inch deep tray was actually preferential flow right along the edge of that tray. It was accidental. Water doesn't get through conventional tillage when it has a flower like consistency. You gonna talk about the slate test? Do you have a slide on was there one in there? Uh, I don't think so. We can just advance. Uh, the slake test, some of you guys probably know about that, and, and the soils from, from my cover crop livestock fields um, lost zero soil. They had been there for, was it three hours when we finally dumped them? And there, there was no soil in the bottom. So our soils are extremely stable doing this. And they didn't start that? No, no, it was a dead, the soil was basically dead. Uh, it was a brome monoculture for years, uh, decades in fact, and we'd exported all the hay, the nutrients off this for generations, so wasn't much left to it. And we do the same thing uh, in, our, in our annually crop systems when we bale up and haul off the residue and make a habit of it. Um, first and foremost, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna try to improve soil health, we've gotta cover up our soil, right? Well, if we bale it all up and take it away, with the exception of what's still anchored and vertical, what's there to protect us from the impact of the raindrop? Uh, we're st this isn't mycorrhizal fungi, of course, but uh, we, we are seeing a lot of biological activity. It was, this was a manure pat that some species of fungi was, was taking down in the soil and, and sharing it with everybody else. And it was, it's a neat picture to see. So, but our, uh, yes, our fungal count has gone up tremendously from where we started. I don't have the data today. I apologize for that. But. I think we're probably going to end up building a fact sheet yeah, it will be. Based on your project alone. Um, note the soil that's sticking to the sorghum sedan grass plant's roots. Um, that is the very beginning of regenerating soils, building soil health. I think this wouldn't be new, but I'm going to say it anyhow, just in case it is new for even one person in the room. So your plants are leaky, right? Through root exudates, they're releasing a sugary substance off the root hairs and the ends of the root tips and your soil biology flocks to that spot. It's the most biologically active part of your soils, and it's called the rhizosphere if you need to give it a term. And that sticky substance causes that soil to kind of flocculate and hold in that position. It starts with the individual grains of sand, silt, and clay. We start to glue some of those together, just like if you stick your fingers in sugar water, as that water evaporates off, you're still left with a sticky residue on your hand, and uh, and that's that's exactly what Riley's doing uh, in the soil environment <clears throat> to see and maybe even justify and explain what's happening above ground. Well, we need to use more of our, our sharpshooter spades to see what's happening below ground. Because not all plants do this equally. They all do it in some way, but not equally. So the day of Riley's tour, it was at 10 a.m. I think that's what it says. Yep, just before 10 a.m. The air temperature was 90 degrees. Okay, we were starting to get uncomfortable. I think it got into the mid 90s by afternoon. Thank God we had tents to re retire to. In the grass cover adjacent to his field, this is one of be this would be pretty much your bro monoculture, but we have adequate soil armor. There was plenty of recovery, so the growing season had served the, the plants well. The soil temperature at that same time was 80 degrees. Okay valuable information, but so what? What's next? Sorry. 
in the cover crop, you know, we're approaching 90. Not, not quite as much cover uh, as canopy cover is concerned as the brome, but it's still very good, still works. What next? I found a gap in the field. Something happened, this drill skipped or something like that. Over 100 degrees, pushing 110 degrees soil temperature and just in that top inch or two. I think, Chris, you were talking about uh, something that was happening just in the top inch or two relative to livestock grazing and your pre-plant soil tests for fertility. That's where it really matters, right? When we're, when we're sticking new, new germinating seedlings in soil, if it's unprotected, we have a large influx, or not an influx, but a large variation in temperature from sunrise until mid-afternoon, right? Why that matters, if we care about the living part of the soil, is that when we get to that 108, 110, 113 degree mark, some of our microbial species start to die. And just like us, I know I'm not nearly as productive when it's 105 as I am when it's 75. If you're, if you're comfortable, your soil biology is probably comfortable. If you're starting to sweat, maybe get a little lazy, looking to shade up, your soil biology is probably behaving in the same way. So that day we were approaching that threshold where some microbial species start dying at 10 in the morning. If we had gone and done that again at 2.30 in the afternoon, it probably would have been 120 degrees in that bare spot. Meanwhile, under the canopy cover of the cover crop or in the grass cover, we still would have been in that acceptable range. So, so the value of the soil armor and minimizing soil disturbance through any means, whether it's herbicide, insecticide, uh, tillage, obviously, uh, those are things that we need to really gut check ourselves on because we might be giving away the very life-giving stuff that we have present in our soils. I pointed you to this 11 by 17 page on the rail. If you didn't grab it on your way in, grab it on your way out to think on this a little bit. We've got a narrative at the bottom of it that uh, a few of us in South Dakota added to this, this uh, the work of somebody else, but uh, are all of those plants tap-rooted? Or are all of them fibrous rooted? No. We have diversity in our rooting structures, just like we have diversity in the leaf shapes, leaf lengths, and even bloom period, the color of the flower, the whole host. There's diversity above ground and below ground, and we need to be sure that we're reflecting that in our crop rotations if we're cash croppers. Because if we don't, our soil is slipping away. Maybe not literally, it might not be blowing away, it might not be washing away, although that could be possible. But what's slipping away is the, the function of life in our soils. What happens if you fast for a week? Fast, not eat. All you're allowed is water. Are you gonna feel as good on day seven as you did on the afternoon of day one? What if you continued it for another couple weeks or three months? You can challenge me if you want, but look at the growing season. The frost <coughs> period in South Dakota pushes on 260, 280 days. How long do your cash crops grow? 90, maybe, 100? How are you feeding your soil biology the rest of that 260 or 280 days? We can do it with diverse crop rotations, with cover crops behind your small grains, I'm not foolish. I understand that your row crops don't have generally enough of a window to plant a cover crop behind. But have you considered flying some on or interceding if the conditions are right? This is how you can enhance the function of your soils. Just some ideas. Go ahead. It just so happens that there's four young ladies focused in this photo. One of them is Riley's daughter. Um, the future of agriculture. These young ladies were soaking up the conversation of Dr. Chris Nichols and Dr. Ray Ward, as well as the neighboring ranchers that were asking questions that day. And uh, those who are gonna control what's happening in agriculture show up. So I'm really glad you're here. I bet all of us wish that we could have loaded up three of our neighbors that really need to hear stuff like this. But um, <coughs> showing up, that's my encouragement. So here we are, this is last week. Uh, I got pears on there. I still, Yes, I still have calves on the cow. Um, 
we're targeting 60% utilization, that's before and after, uh, with a single strand uh, poly wire. So I just was doing the numbers again this morning. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you don't do it uh, for the soil health, health benefits, do it for the money. Uh, it's costing me about $1.25 a day to run a pair on this. Uh, I know that the calves will gain two and a half to three pounds a day. Uh, so if you break those numbers down, my cost to gain is 10 cents a, a pound. Any feedlot guys in here? Feedlot cost to gain is $1.10 plus right now. I'm doing it for a fraction of that. Um, you run those numbers back again, and just the, the added value of the gain on my calves is $500 an acre for doing this. That's not counting the nutrients that we're cycling back into the soil. So it, is it work? Absolutely. Uh, and we'll, we're, it's gonna continue to be part of our winter strategy. Uh, I, th I, I threw this slide, just a second, sir. We'll, um, uh, I, I challenge the, the conventional mindset versus regenerative mindset quite often with people. And, and this one is a, uh, challenges the, the assumption that, that we go dormant in the winter. And this is not true. This is after the snow went off in January last year. And this is well-rested pasture that's covered and tillered. And it's absolutely not dormant. It's, it's growing and thriving. And this is what we try to nurture on our place. Uh, we, with our, I should have elaborated that earlier, but our, our grazing is, we, we're short duration, high intensity, and we rest these pastures for 12 months before we come back. And we're gonna measure again this next year, but we're pretty sure our, our forage production has doubled just from management changes, no inputs. Um, and that's since you came back to the ranch. Yeah, it's in the last five years. So um, enough, in fact, that we're, we're able to add a stalker, opera, stalker enterprise this next year. So, I mean, this is, this is what we do. We, we protect the land and the plants. That's more important than the cows. Cows are a tool to harvest that. I failed to introduce myself, my apologies. Riley mm -hmm. started in because we wanted to get this content to you. My name is Tans Herman. I'm a grazing land soil health specialist with NRCS. I was working in the Sturgis field office when Riley first spawned this idea. We got kicking it around and, and then went on into this project. Um, Valerie Ryder is in the room. She's the district conservationist in Sturgis now and, and has been offering support and help as well. Um, this is a partnership effort. Now, CIG, Conservation Innovation Grant is just that. We're testing semi-unproven methodology, right? And with three years of data, we're convinced. Um, and providing you a presentation in under 30 minutes maybe doesn't totally convince you, but uh, as we get into the growing season, don't be afraid to put on some miles and get to some workshops. Uh, come to the Soil Health Conference uh, in, at the end of January that the Soil Health Coalition puts on. Go to the South Dakota No-Till Association meetings and, uh, and learn. Because we can stand up here and talk until we're blue in the face, but I know that farmers and ranchers learn best from one another what's working because you have a trusting relationship already built. So just keep doing this stuff. You can reach me. I'm pretty easy to find. We'll land on the slide with Riley's contact. Yeah, that's my contact info. You had a question we needed to address yet. Yep, yeah. sure. Do you run bees for anything for germination of all the plant, like wildlife plants? Bees, yeah, we have bees on the place. Yeah, yeah. Not ours, of course, but yeah. When you yeah. first started out, what did you start with? Or where did you, where did you say, this is where we're going to start point, this is what we're shooting for? On the cover crop are you, or? Are you cover crops on flat land or rolling hills? Did you have native grass, buffalo grass? What did you have? The, these, were, these were traditionally hay fields that we had that uh, the one in particular was summer, summer fallowed wheat ground in the 70s and 80s and then we put it back into hay. These were all basically hay fields so on, on relatively flat ground. Yeah. How about ranch ground? Beginning with rolling hills. Okay. 
So these are these were monoculture hay fields that are that were completely depleted. And it's and it's easy to uh, some of you might say, well, just fertilize it. Well, I was an applicator for quite a few years, and and I was applying nutrients that came from Ukraine so we can send corn to China. Yeah. It made zero sense to me. Taking Russian Russian phosphorus. Yeah. So. I just I knew there had to be a different way and a better way to do it and keep it keep it simple. So does that answer your question? Yes, it is. Okay. So you kind of kind of got a two-pronged presentation there. <coughs> this was necessary because of the change that Riley was applying to his grazing management and the need to kill the feed bill. The end goal with this is is back to a native grass seeding. I didn't say that earlier, but that is the end goal the next on these and then we'll the other depleted hay fields will go through uh, how much did we cut hay feeding down we uh, on 340 head of cows we we fed 60 bales of hay last year we had a lot of winter not as much as maybe some of you guys did but uh, we had a lot of winter so yeah we're, we're absolutely cutting expenses we're, um, did you terminate your mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used uh, glyphosate. I used a high rate of that. And since the termination, we just are at a very low rate of glyphosate. Uh, 24 ounces is what I used last year. So, so this, the cover crop, is it basically transitional? So you're saying you're eventually trying to get back to native, native grass. Native yep. grass, so it's transitional? We're, we're, yes, we're, putting, we're trying to put root mass, uh, manure, organic matter back to it to build the soil biology to go back to a successful native grass seeding. Well, yeah, you can go, you can, you can take out brome and plant grass, but it, it doesn't do anything in our area. It, as, as arid as we are, it, uh, it'll just sit there. And the plants are, the plants aren't healthy because the soil's not healthy. Uh, and, and by resting our pastures, there's some that will disagree with that, uh, the long rest, but all the health problems went away on our cattle when we, we let the plants become healthy, uh, we just, we don't have any troubles anymore. They just, all they, they all went away. So there, there's more going on here than I, what I can explain, but I know what I see. Did you have any grasshopper pressure? I mean, there were so many grasshoppers every year. Oh, don't get me started on grasshoppers. They sprayed 800,000 acres of grasshoppers in Meade County. It makes me sick. It's the environmental travesty of our time. Uh, I know some of you will disagree with me. Uh, all they're doing is creating more grasshopper problems because they, they're killing the predators off. Uh, I sprayed IGRs. They kill everything. Uh, I have natural predators on our place. I don't have pictures of them today. I, I have, we have ground spiders about every three or four feet in our rangeland. And when we start getting grasshoppers on every, they, they have a little uh, web about like this. Um, every one of those has a dozen grasshopper carcasses on it. Okay, so what's the first thing that's gonna die when I put an IGR on the, on the rangeland? It, those spiders aren't gonna make it. I'm sorry, they're just not. Um, the other reason we have spiders is because we rest our pastures, okay? We, we have the, a lush, green uh, and we have a canopy and it keeps that soil cool look around us nobody cares about grass they they, they graze it to the dirt it's like they want to kill it and we have bare soil and we have, you know you've seen the the thermometer that soil heats up what does it do to the biology it kills it and we are honestly conventional agriculture is a culture of death we're trying to kill 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 insecticides Herbicides. I hate herbicides. I still I have to use a little dose. If anybody's got a better suggestion, I'd like to know. Um, I absolutely will not till it. When you start learning this stuff, you, you can't unlearn it, and you can't go back to the old ways. You can't. Sorry, I got a little long there. <laughs> but ironically, applying cover crops to the landscape is old, right? Yeah, it's not you new. You won't go back to the old ways that you know result in death but we are returning to old ways of resulting in life. Um, 
and reinvigorating that diversity. Um, and obviously livestock and the land were implied. You're talking to a rancher here today, but um, um, if, if they're not part of your operation and you have no interest in owning cattle, that's okay. Um, <coughs> work with the neighbor. Hook up with the grazing exchange. Cindy stepped out of the room, but Soil Health Coalition has a grazing exchange. Find somebody with livestock that's looking for grazing and, and get the value. Chris's information supported what we've observed on Riley's place this morning, that uh, livestock impact on the land when grazing management is done appropriately on crop helps. It certainly doesn't hurt. So, yeah. Uh, uh, another one on, on the grasshoppers what we noticed. So I absolutely would not let them spray with the airplane on our, on our range land. And it was early August, the grasshoppers went away and the crickets came by the thousands. Crickets are on the IGR label. Uh, if we just sprayed, we'd have killed the natural predator, one of the other natural predators of the grasshoppers. So I look at things in a completely different view than most people. I mean, most people, they, they've, they, they're out of feed, for one, and they panic, and that's the first thing they do is, is spray. So. Where do your babies go when they're weaned? Pardon? Where do the babies go when they're weaned? Where do they go? Yeah. We're going to, uh, here in about a week and a half, we're going to wean them, um, and then they're, the, the calves are going to go back to this cover crop field, I'm reserving 30 or 40 acres for them, and the cows will go to another one. And then we'll have them, the calves weaned, they're on the gain, they won't lose any weight through weaning, and then we're ready to market them whenever, if this market decides to pick up here this next month, so. Yes, sir? How often are you moving the cows? Uh, two to three days. I gave them a two day allotment yesterday uh, and they'll be ready to move in the morning again, so. You said you had 340 cows, how big are the patches? I gave them 10 acres yesterday morning, so they're, I gave them a little more, they're using about four acres a day on this, so. What would the alternative result be if you just opened the gates, Riley, and didn't use the polywire? Yeah, they would walk it off, they would, they'd go, the herd would go from one end to the other and they just would stomp it off and you wouldn't get the harvest use, utilization like I'm showing there. So we're, we're trying to harvest about 60%, we're leaving the other 40% on the, on the soil surface. Yeah, Cause they, you could see they mashed it down pretty good. That's what I want is armor. Um, I can't go, I, I've tried to push it to get a little better than that and they'll, they'll get to pushing on my fence and trying to push through. So that's where, that's our target rate right there. Um, Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, well, I was just curious where you think, yeah, you mentioned some of the, your future plans, but where do you think the future lies? Where, where, where is the research lacking? What, what needs to be done? What's the next? I don't think the research is lacking. I think there's enough out there. It's just we have to change the paradigm of how people see things and, and, and willing to change and do things different. That's kind of why I'm here, you know, to raise awareness of, of, of other things we can do. So. I see a lot of row trees. Did you put the trees in? Here? Yeah. Uh, that's up in the foothills of the Black Hills. This is, uh, those are pine trees and, and scrub oaks there. That's, that is isn't our place actually, I, I leased that, so. Yeah, those weren't, weren't planted. Those no, were those, are, those are native yeah. plants, yep. Do you do any plant additions? Trees. The grass. Do you do anything else? No, I haven't. I haven't. It's hard to get trees to grow where we're at, so haven't haven't planted much. So. Well, Riley and I plan to join you all for lunch. So uh, those questions you don't want to ask in front of the group, you could probably just sit down next to the end of the year. Thanks, everybody.